victorious Faithfulness none can deny Through the storm and through the fire There is truth that sets me free Jesus Christ who lives in me You are stronger You are stronger Sin is broken You have saved me It is written Christ is risen Jesus you are Lord This is what I found today. <laughs> what a joy. What a joy to be able to walk in the church and see something so beautiful. To see something like this that reminds me of those that we serve 
for the, of those that love us and that we love. What a great gesture. I want to say thank you, church family, for what y'all have done. Thank you so much for your love and kindness toward me and my family. And what an excitement to be able to come in and find something so beautiful that reminds me of a loving church family. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Roxy Baptist Church family. Uh, I would like to start by saying welcome, of course, but I would like to say this, thank you. Thank you to the church family and for those that uh, took um, <laughs> the energy and the time uh, to come and, well, first to gather all the wonderful pictures and then to take the time to come in and, and place them where you would normally be sitting. Uh, it is a blessing. So we thank you so much for the love and the kindness that you've shown your pastor. It does mean a lot to my heart. I can't tell you. It was, it was a true surprise. Uh, what a wonderful blessing. What a wonderful blessing. Uh, it, it made my week. So thank you. Uh, but I do want to welcome you to this morning's service and just say that uh, as we begin this morning, uh, there are... On, no on-site visits or campus uh, services at the moment. Uh, we will be continuing to watch and we'll let you know. But as of right now, it looks like we'll be continuing what we're doing at least throughout the end of, of May. And then we'll be uh, reevaluating that situation there with the finance committee along with the deacons and uh, uh, the church leadership. So continue to pray for us as we seek the wisdom to lead and guide. So let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin. Uh, Father God, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day. Lord, we thank you for an opportunity to be in your house again. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to, to uh, share the gospel. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to meet together with our church family. Even though it's by video feed, Lord, we just praise you for that. And Lord, we look forward to the day that we're able to meet again together here in your house with the family of God. But Lord, in the meanwhile, we will continue to serve. We will continue to worship. Lord, we continue to just praise your name in every opportunity we get. So, Father, Lord, today we lift up the Whitehead family for you, for Miss Shirley's family. Lord, we pray for them. Pray that you continue to walk with them, Lord, and comfort them through this time of sorrow. Lord, we just pray that you be with those that are sick. Watch over them. Strengthen them, Lord. Give them the, uh, the ability, Lord, to continue on in the face of adversity. But, Father God, we pray also that you might grant their healing. Father God, Lord, we ask, Lord, that you continue to protect our health care workers. Lord, be with those that are serving the sick. Lord, be with those that are, Lord, getting up every day and going in and doing their part to make sure there's someone there to provide and take care of those that are hurting. So, Father God, Lord, we say thank you for all that you've done for us. Lord, we do pray you give our president, Lord, vice president, our governor, and all those that are in leadership places, Lord, the wisdom they need to lead us through this time. But, Father God, Lord, we know that we as a country, Lord, that we as, as a nation, Lord, we as a people, Lord, need to turn our eyes toward heaven. Lord, seek your wisdom. Lord, understand that you are in control. You are in charge. And Father God, Lord, cry out asking for forgiveness, Lord, and allow you to lead us, Lord, in comfort. And teach us, Lord, what we need to be doing during this time. So Father God, Lord, we say thank you. Lord, visit with us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God is three in one. 
I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again for I believe in the name of Jesus Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified forgiveness is in you descended into darkness you rose in glorious light forever seated high I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son
passed by mine to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy storm, Messiah still and all alone. The Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, trample death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. And oh, praise the name of the chapter 14. That's where I have been studying where uh, I ask you to turn with me as we look again at life after, life after COVID-19 and what will be the challenge of faith. What will be the challenge to our faith after COVID-19 after the time 
of separation and, separation and isolation and we come back together. And as others may come and be a part of us, as we begin to look out into the communities and into the areas around our churches and see what we may do to serve those that are out there, how we uh, may do our part to share the gospel, how we uh, become kingdom-minded and begin to turn that focus to those that are yet on the outside. I pray that that is your heart. I pray that during this time of isolation, you've had an opportunity to sit down and ask God, what would he expect of you? How you might serve him more? How you might begin to live even more in faith after this. But today, as we look in Luke chapter 14, verses 15 through 24, this is called the parable of the Great Supper, where Jesus is invited in for a feast. And one of the first things that they would they did is that as they invited him into these place, this place here, they invited him not because they really wanted him there, but because they wanted to try to catch him and or mock him or Catch him breaking one of their laws so that they could use it against him in some way. So you understand something. Their hearts wasn't in the right place. So it's starting in the first part of chapter 14 there. Jesus heals the man with what they call a dropsy on the Sabbath. And then he just put it to a point blank. Because we know over in chapter 13 that when he healed... Um, when he healed in chapter 13 of the woman of the spirit of infirmity, they, they actually began to uh, ridicule him, the ruler of the synagogue there. And, uh, but here in chapter 14, Jesus starts out by asking, he said, you know what, it, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And boy, they were caught off guard. They were caught off guard. See, I think that when we come to a time of worship and our hearts has the right intent, our hearts has the... Uh, our heart is turned toward heaven. You know, uh, we're looking for the things of God. And we understand the things of God. But here, they were caught off guard and they were silent. They didn't have anything to say. Because they did not know how to answer Jesus in such a way that they would have some type of defense. So as we get into the part of where the, the text is today, I want you to understand, and let's take their heart again, the intent of their heart here. In, in, in verse 15, we find where the man begins to talk about heaven. And let's see, let's see what it or talks about the kingdom of God. And let's see what it says here, starting in verse 15. Read with me now, and it says, Now when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then he said to him, A certain man, now this is Jesus speaking, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many, and sent his servants at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come eat, for all things are now ready. But they all, with one accord, begin to make excuses. First, the first said to him, For I have bought a piece of ground, and I must go and see it. I ask that you that I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I am going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. And still another, I have married a wife. And therefore, I cannot come. So that the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servants, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city, and bring in the poor, and the maimed, and the lame, and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded. And there is still room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in, that my house might be or may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. I want you to know right here, when you think of the situation of the invite, you know, these were people that had uh, second thoughts. You ever heard of somebody having second thoughts? You know, uh, 
that uh, sometimes we've heard of people having new car, buy or buyer's remorse type things. I want you to understand something. We must understand what we've signed on to as a child of God. What we have said yes to. That we have said yes to the kingdom of God. We have said yes to His plans. We have said yes to His ways. To His will. And then that's what we're supposed to ascribe to. That is what we're supposed to... That is what we are supposed to abide by. That's how we're supposed to live. Just as I spoke about uh, Miss Shirley from the Beatitudes, the start of her funeral there. And I, and I really believe that. You know what? The Beatitudes, that word blessed uh, in that idea. But it, it should, this should be what our attitude. This should be our attitude. One that is godly. One that it, 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 it shows and magnifies the kingdom of God. And I want you to understand something. That's what we've signed on to. And that's what we must continue to proclaim till the day the Lord comes back. And I want to cover that with you. I want you and I to take a few moments to think about this. Because I want to tell you the first point that I thought about this week is, is this. You know what? The heart does not lie. The heart does not lie. Think about this. You know what? Jesus told them, where does murder, war, all the things, where do the things come from? They come from the heart. I, that's what we truly want. That's what we truly, truly want. Our desires are bared out. We may say one thing with our mouth, but our actions reveal another. And I want to ask you today, what about your actions? What about my actions? You know what? Understand this. Religious people are good at what they do. Religious people. Sometimes being religious, and that's the idea of this, and, and nothing derogatory. But folks, I want you to know something. We need to be godly people. We need to have those people, those hearts that, of people that love the Lord and want to honor Him in all that we do and say. And I know it's hard. I know it's a battle. But I want you to understand something. When we keep our eyes on the kingdom of God, when we keep our hearts open to the Holy Spirit, and when we keep our eyes in His Word, then we're able to accomplish the things that He would have us accomplish. And then therefore our hearts will bear out what our mouth professes. Look again in Luke chapter 14, verse 15 again. And it says, Now when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat the bread in the kingdom of God. I mean, you know what he's talking about here is, is the, the places of honor. Jesus had just got through uh, in the verses there before, uh, in verses 7 through 14, telling them that when you come in, he gave the idea when all the people came into the place to sit down, they began to look for the places close to the one throwing the thing or the one that was in the, the very front place. We know here they probably wasn't Baptist because they didn't go immediately to the back row. No, they wanted to be up front and in every thing and they wanted to be right there and they wanted to be known for who they were or for what was going on. And Jesus told them that the more appropriate thing would be to do would be to do this. It would be to humble yourself. It would be to go take a place that was in the lowest of places, that you may be in the time that the host or whoever may would come and bring you forward as opposed to one sitting in a place of unworthiness or sitting in a place that uh, was not the place for them and being asked to step down. It would be better to be brought up than to be taken down. So this particular man then begin to speak out of the abundance of his heart. Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. You know what? I want you to understand when we stop and we think about that, what does that right there tell us? You know, an idea of, you know, we understand that the kingdom of God is uh, something great, but it's almost as if it, if it kind of we look at the kingdom of God as tickling our fancy as it's setting us in the right place or putting us, you know, God is saying here, you know, God is to be exalted, man is not. And when we begin to understand that, 
then we would be in the situation of looking toward the kingdom of God saying something to be longed for, something to be expected, not because of us, but because of God. That we're not a religious people that can have the idea that we believe that we are worthy of standing in a place. Look at the hearts of the people just back in chapter 13 when the healing of the woman, the spirit infirmity. You know what? The ruler of the synagogue there, you know what? Said there's six other days. Why not come, you know, come be healed then? But not on the Sabbath. But Jesus focusing in on their heart, he said, which one of you that would have an oxen? Which one of you and have an oxen or a donkey that wouldn't go into the stall and lead them out to drink. In other words, their hearts were not right. Their hearts were being revealed out. Instead of celebrating, instead of celebrating, this was one of their one of their own that had was crippled, one of their own that was in need. And what he's saying here to them is, you know what, we need to be a heart, a people of, of true. Trueness of our heart. You know what? That, that our hearts bear out what our words profess. I want you to remember something. You know what? When he spoke to them about uh, the woman in chapter 13, Jesus spoke to them and said, This is a daughter of Abraham. Daughter of Abraham. And she's been like this 18 years. Jesus was pleading with their reason of their mind. But yet their hearts were not being budged. I want you to understand something. This man here, Wolf, he was thinking so much about how great it was going to be. In God's kingdom, how great it was going to be. The place that they would all be called to. That's in a sense of almost worthiness. Folks, I want you to understand something. We are not worthy. We are not worthy. By our own making. Only by God's grace and His love for man are we allowed to share and take part in the kingdom of God. And we need to remember that. We need to remember that. And I want you to know, I couldn't help but go back to something we were talking about here not long ago in Matthew chapter 15 in verses 9. And, and when we're talking about how people today desire to line themselves up religiously instead of godly. You know what? And Jesus' disciples were being uh, fussed at, or, or Jesus was, by the Pharisees and the scribes, Jesus was being talked to about his disciples not washing their hands when they ate bread. And man, they were talking, why do you break our traditions? Why do you break the traditions of the elders? And he looked at them and said, you know, why do you break the commandments of God? You know, folks, I want you to understand something. It's, it shouldn't be in God's house that the reason we do the things we do is because that's the way we've always done them. It's because it needs to bring honor and glory to the name of Jesus Christ. And I hope and pray that's your desire. That our hearts, that when our hearts uh, bear out, you know what? Because they don't lie. That they bear out what our lips have said. If we're children of God, I hope our hearts bear out the fact that we are children of God. But listen what Matthew chapter 15 verses 1 through 9 says. Then the scribes and the Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your, your disciples transgress the tradition of elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And he answered to them and said, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God? Because of your tradition. For God commanded saying, Honor your mother and your father. And he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whoever says to his father or mother, Whatever profit might he have received from me is a gift to God. Then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect, but by your tradition, hypocrites. There's that word that's been common on Wednesday night. It's been common on our ser uh, sermons of late. Listen to what it says. Well, did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, 
These people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their hearts, but their hearts is far, their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. You know what? I want you to understand something. Our desire should be to honor the Lord. Our desire should not be for a place. Our desire ought to be to do whatever we can to humble ourselves in service to the Lord and rejoice in whatever place He gives us. You know, which is greater? Our desire to be seen, heard, honored, above another. Or is it to honor God with righteous living and service? Because see, there's one other thing. The next thing that I want you to understand about this Salvation is from the true desire of the heart. What do you mean? I want you to understand something. We are saved by faith. Faith. Faith come by hearing. Hearing come by the Word. We live it out. It's what we live. If we are saved, we should live like we're saved. If we have salvation, it ought to be evident that we have salvation. You know what? It's from the realization of who we are and the renewed desire to be. That's what it is. In other words, now that the Holy Spirit's come on me and told me who I am before God, that I am one that's unworthy, I am a sinner, I am lost, I'm set apart. Now that I have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that I, my sins are washed away, I'm covered under the blood of Christ, and now that I go out, and live my life in appreciation for what Jesus has done for me because my focus is now on the kingdom of God. Is that your desire? Is that my desire? Selfish desire for glory and place gets us nowhere in the kingdom of God. I want you to think. Listen to what verse, chapter 14, verses 16 through 17 says again. Listen to what it says. Then he said to him, a certain man, this is Jesus speaking, gave a great supper, invited many, and sent out his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. I want you to understand something. It's Jesus is speaking here. It was a custom in that day that what they would do is they would send out invitations to a great feast, to some celebration. And as those invitations would get out and go out, the people would answer and say, yes, I'm coming. And as the invitations, the yeses came back, the, I guess you'd say the RSVP of that day would come back. Then the, the, hostess would make, the host would make the count. And in that day, they would take that and give it to the, to the servants. And the servants would prepare the meal according to that. And according to that, they would have the preparation made for the feast. And when the feast was ready, and when the feast was ready, then they would send word out a second time. And said, okay, now that you've said you're coming, now that you've signed on, and I want you to understand. He said, now the time is now. It's ready. Come. And then when the second invitation came to come, people began to say, no, I'm not coming. I can't come. I got this or I got that. Folks, I want you to understand so many times today that's what we've done. And you know what? I want you to understand all of us at one time in life, one time or another, have signed on for something without really thinking it through. And we thought to ourselves, that's what I want to do, only to decide later, boy, I wish I hadn't done that. And even if sometimes we backed out. But I want you to understand something. When we signed on to salvation saying that Jesus Christ was Lord and Savior, that's something you don't want to try to back out of. That is one of those things that you want to, you want to press forward, you want to hold on to. But I want to ask you this question. Now, I really want you to hear me through when I say this. Do we desire to be saved now? Or just saved from the fire of hell later? As I sit there in my office at the house thinking about that. Wow. You know what? How many times people don't want to give up the life they're living here in exchange for salvation 
They want to keep still living like hell and claim to be saved, but escape the fire of hell later. See, here's what I'm trying to tell you. That's why I said it this. Salvation is from the true desire of the heart. And remember what we just got through covering, that idea being this. Listen again to what it says. The heart does not lie. The heart does not lie. You know, why do you think Jesus kept calling them hypocrites? You know what? The church is not to be hypocrites. The church is to be the church. That is the bride of Christ. Jesus is going to come back. You know what he's going to say? The, the table is set. Everything is ready. Now go get my people in time. And we're going to find that some said yes. But some never really meant they were coming. And I want you to know something. The feebleness of excuses won't get us through. You know, just like when Jesus spoke again, as I said in chapter 13, when he spoke to him, he said, which one of you that had a donkey or an oxen wouldn't go and lead it out of the stall? See, they wasn't concerned about the things of, of God. They weren't they wouldn't concerned about the healing. They weren't concerned uh, about being set apart. You know what? They, they, they loved the idea, the idea of the Sabbath. And that they could go and they could live their life supposedly right with God on one day. And in the six other days out of the week they could do what they wanted. Wash their hands when they were supposed to. Do the other things they were supposed to. Check these blocks. Check these boxes and then show up for church and be right with God. But Jesus said it's more than showing up. It's about the heart. And if the heart's not right, if the heart doesn't bear out, you know what, the heart doesn't lie. When the, when, when, when the heart doesn't line up with the words or the words doesn't line up with the heart, whichever way you want to look at it, then we begin to understand that. That when we say we're saved and we don't live like we're saved, what's wrong? Something has to be wrong. You know what, and I'm going to tell you something, it's just like you said, the, 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 the man, a certain man sent out the invitations and asked them to come and they said yes and now he sent out again and said you know what go and get them and tell them to come and be ready you know why is it the church is not here on Sunday mornings when we're able to be why is it we put other things before worship why is it we get up during the week and we put other things before studying God's word other things before prayer time Folks, I know life can get busy. I understand that. And I want to tell you a story of a young man. Of a young man that was getting ready to graduate from college. And after many months, uh, uh, as he knew he was getting ready to prepare, uh, graduate from college, he began to ride around and think about what he might want for graduation. And he began to admire for several months a sports car. I don't know what type it was, but he, he admired that sports car, drive by that dealership every day and think, man, I've done it. I, I'm going to be completing this time. What a wonderful time. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to, I, I know my dad can afford it, so this is, is going to be my hope. My hope and my dreams are that my dad would give me this car. And he told his dad, you know, that that's all he wanted. That's all he wanted. And I want, uh, you know, his graduation day approached. The young man was uh, awaiting signs that his father maybe had purchased this car for him, had it all ready, you know. And then when his dad called him into his study, the story is told this when he walked into the study, his dad gave him a box wrapped up. And he, it was a beautiful wrapped box. And he tore into the box and opened it up out of curiosity. But then the young man was. A little disappointed because the young man, the young man opened it up and inside that he found a leather bound Bible with his name embossed on it in gold. And he was so angry he raised his voice to his father. He said it this way He said, With all the money, you give me a Bible rather than the sports car I wanted. Then he stormed out of the house, leaving the Bible behind. Many years passed, the young man was very successful in business that he went into, and it says 
He had a beautiful home, a wonderful family, but he realized when he thought about his father that he was very old. And then he decided that perhaps he should go to see him because he hadn't seen him since that graduation day. However, before he could make arrangements to go, he received a phone call from a funeral home director telling him that his father had passed away. And he had willed all of his possessions to him. And he was told that he needed to come home immediately and take care of things. And when the son arrived at his father's house, sadness and regret filled his heart. He began to search, for, search through his father's things and important documents. And he saw the Bible his father had given him for graduation. The Bible looked as new as it did years ago when it was given with tears in his eyes, he opened up the Bible and began to turn through the pages. His father had carefully underlined a verse, which was in Matthew chapter 11, which reads, And if ye being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father, which is in heaven, give those who ask Him? As his son read, the, read those words, a car key dropped from the back of the Bible. It had a tag on it with the car dealer's name. The same dealer who had the sports car that he wanted so badly for his college graduation. On the tag was the date of the graduation. The words written in large print. Paid in full. Paid in full. Many times during it, during our lifetimes, you know, we think about it. The greatest gift is not packaged the way we want it to be. It's not. It doesn't look that way. So we have a hard time accepting the gift because of the way it's packaged. I want you to understand something. Salvation is based on God's terms. Salvation is based on God's grace. It's a free gift. But it's not free to abuse and use in any way we want. It's meant to be used for the kingdom of God. It's meant to be used for the sharing of the gospel. And I want you to understand that. I want you to know that. I want you to believe that with all your heart. In Luke chapter 13, we find these words about narrow, the narrow way, the way less chosen. I want you to listen to these words as Jesus speaks and listen to what, starting in verse 22, that's where we want to pick up there. Verse 22 through 27. And he went through the city and the villages teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, verse 24, And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter, but will not be able. When, when once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, you and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you. I do not know you. Where are you from? Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence. And you talked in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you. Where are you from? Depart from me. All you workers of iniquity. It's up to us to be heavenly and kingdom minded. Because folks, I want to tell you this. With salvation and being saved under God's grace, remember this. There's no room for change of heart. God means what He says and says what He means. But do we? Do we? Listen again in Luke chapter 14, verses 18 through 24. But they all, with one accord, began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must go 
and see it. How many of us would ever buy a piece of property without looking at it first? His excuse is flimsy. He said, I ask, to, I ask you to have me excused. Another said, I have bought five oxen and I am going to test them. And I ask you to have me excused. How many of us would purchase any animal, especially back in that day, they would not purchase that animal without knowing they could plow before then. They would not need testing. The excuse was flimsy. Still another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servants, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city, and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and there's still room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. You know what? I want you to understand something here. We've been invited. The invitation is for you and I. The invitation is to come to Jesus. Come to Him because you know what? The reason it is to come to Him is this. Number one, salvation. So that we may be reunited with our Creator. That we may live with Him forever. That we may have salvation. But I want you to understand something. For this world, we need salvation. We need to know Jesus. We need Him walking with us. And we need to know how to serve Him. And we need Him leading us and guiding us through this land. Today. I want you to know this. That we have no room for change of heart. When we signed on to the gospel, when we signed on to salvation, saying yes to the Lord, there's no room for backing up. It's only to forge ahead. Why? That's where the greatest blessings in life are found, in God's grace. I want you to do this. I want to read this new version of Footprints in the Sand, that it might give you this picture of what I have come to believe that happens as we get closer to heaven. As we get closer to heaven. Because you see, in salvation, as we begin to walk with the Lord, sometimes it's tough to learn new, the new way of life. But as we stay in His words, we pray, as we fellowship in the body of Christ, we grow and we, we begin to better understand what God wants of us and expects of us and what He's doing for us. So I want you to listen to this as I close. And listen to what this says. It's called the new version of Footprints in the Sand. Imagine you and the Lord Jesus walking down the road together. For much of the way, the Lord's footprints go along steadily, constantly, rarely, vary the pace. But your footprints are disorganized. Streams of zigzags, starts, stops, turns, turn around, circles, departures, and returns. For much of the way, it seems to go like this. But gradually, your footprints come more in line with the Lord's, soon paralleling His constantly. You and Jesus are walking as true friends. It seems perfect, but then an interesting thing happens. Your footprints at one, uh, at once etched the sand next to the masters are now walking precisely in the same in his steps in his larger footprints is the small sand print safely enclosed you and Jesus are becoming one this goes on for many miles but gradually you notice another change the footprints inside the larger footprints seem to grow larger. Eventually, it disappears altogether. There's only one set of footprints. They have become one. Again, this goes on for a long time, but then something awful happens. The second set of footprints is back. This time, it seems even worse. Zigzagging all over the place. Starts, stops, deep gashes in the sand. <clears throat> 
just a, a veritable mess. You're amazed and shocked. But this is the end of your dream. Now you speak. Lord, I understand the first scene with the zigzags and fits, and starts, and so on. I was a new Christian, just learning. But you walked through the storm and helped me learn to walk with you. That is correct, says the Lord. Yes, when the smaller footprints inside were inside yours, I was actually learning to walk in your steps, and I followed you very closely. Very good. You have understand everything so far, says the Lord. Then the smaller footprints grew, eventually filled in with yours, and I suppose, and I suppose that I was actually growing so much that I was becoming like you in every way. And the Lord said precisely. But this is my question. Was there a regression or something? The footprints went back to two. And this time, it was worse than the first. And the Lord smiles, then laughs. Saying, you didn't know? He says, that was when we danced. See, the whole part of the beauty of salvation is learning to walk with the Lord. It's learning to stay close to Him. It's in learning to appreciate the invitation. And when Jesus calls us and asks us, it's to walk with Him in such a way that we grow close and that we begin to understand. And then when we turn our eyes, when we go back to what that man said, you know, and I want to share that with you again. I want to share that with you again real quickly. Real quickly. Now when one of those who had sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat the bread. In the kingdom of God. You see. Along the way we learn to dance. But it's not. To our own music. It's to the music of heaven. I pray. You're dancing. With him. For he wants to dance with you. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for your word and the truth of it. Father, we thank you for the salvation you provided. Father, we pray, Lord, that you might continue to cleanse us. Lord, that you might continue to lead us and guide us, Lord, to teach us straight from your throne of grace. Father, I pray today if there be one that's heard this message, Lord, that finds themselves, Lord, in a place that they wouldn't want to be, Father, that they have realized their heart is not lying to them. And that they are going after the, own, the desires of their own heart and not the heart of God. Father, I pray today that we make it right. Father, that you forgive us when we failed you, Lord, that we would come home. Lord, we may right, be made right with you. So, Father God, Lord, we thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.